In the last episode, we heard from Mike Keane from Abellio, who've been running the train service for ScotRail just over a month now. This week, it's the turn of Rob Dixon, Director of Environment and Infrastructure at the Scottish Borders Council, who started by acknowledging the disruption caused by the building of the Borders Railway in Galashiels. There have been a vast number of short-term arrangements, diversions, etc. Compounded, it has to be said, in Gala Shields by other works, uh, the flood protection scheme, and also the work that we're now doing with Scottish Gas. Um, we did take the view that it was going to be painful and we might as well have the pain and try and get it out of the way. And it has been painful. It will continue to be a bit painful for a few months. But um, I think it's clear that the light is at the end of the tunnel and the arrival of the railway and the completion of that infrastructure work should really give us a position which is unrivaled in terms of modern infrastructure for sustainable transport. We've got to look at reconfiguration of the whole bus service in the borders in order that it fits with the railway. There's little point in having a railway if actually for the wider borders, for those people that rely on bus services, it doesn't work and it doesn't inter in, uh, interconnect. Through ticketing, et cetera, et cetera, is all part of that debate, so that's all part of what is being looked at at the moment. At a lower level, we've got changes to school transport because we envisage having children who will travel on the train, certainly to Gala Shields, and that's a change for a generation, obviously. There's a whole piece about road signage. People want to find the stations. The stations are not signposted. There's a whole piece around road signage um, to be looked at, and then cycle network signage as well. So you can see from that 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 public service interface is, is quite substantial. Be in no doubt the council believes a genuine uh, desire to see a line extension to Carlisle and the notion in the national uh, blueprint that we should now commission a feasibility study for that extension. Um, in my own view, it's never too early to start these things. It may take us a generation to get there, but if we start now, we've got some chance of succeeding sooner rather than later. Um, I don't think it'll be in the franchise period. I think you're probably right. But if we don't make the case from the borders, nobody will make the case for our behalf, and we should commence that and begin that work now. It's not as if people didn't fight against the closure and there's some well-known names associated with that campaign in 68 and 69, the Reverend Bryden Mabin, there's Madge Elliott, David Steele of course who was the MP for the area, but also some lesser known characters who were very active, uh, quite young individuals like Andrew Boyd, Chris Harvey and Bruce, Bruce McCartney and they all got out and did the best they could but frankly there was too much apathy in the background. When the official closure proposal came out, there were only 508 objections to closure of the railway, and yet more than 2,000 people a day were using the railway. So the word apathy came up in a lot of my research. I looked through the archives and the border provosts were worried about apathy, and I, I think that proved right, that not enough people cared enough about the loss of the railway, or perhaps thought it was inevitable. The old borders expression, I bin. People thought they couldn't do anything about it. Um, they, they could have done more about it. And I think if the campaign had been mounted earlier and it had broader base support, then maybe the, the end result would have been different. There was a lot of short-termism back then. Uh, the failure to protect the line of route from new house building at the, at the likes of Stow and also up at Gore Bridge and the breaches by roads in and around Newton St Boswells and Melrose and coming further north also in Midlothian and uh, at the Edinburgh City Bypass. Uh, and that's added something like 40% to the cost of reopening the railway. The fact that central and local government did not take a strategic perspective on this and say, at the very least, well, let's protect it as a walking and cycling route and we're keeping our options open. They didn't keep the options open, which meant the new railway is much more expensive than it needed to be. And, you know, that lack of strategic vision started in 1972 and it didn't finish until the year 2000 when uh, part of the, the big roundabout at Harden Green in the A7 was constructed. So the lack of vision lasted a very long time. We've seen it's possible to overcome all kinds of barriers, uh, some very expensive barriers in order to get back to Gala and Tweed Bank. And of course there are barriers beyond Tweed Bank. There's the, the Melrose Bypass, but it's only using up part of all the, the old railway solum. And indeed, of course, there's the old platform still there at Melrose. 
problems around Newton St Boswells again because of road building. But I've walked the whole length of route uh, all the way from New Craig Hall, right, right the way down to Hoyt. Did that a couple of years ago. And once you get south of Newton St Boswells, there's really not a great deal of problem in getting all the way through to Hoyt. Some of the railway's been ploughed up into fields, but there's no really major structural problems between those two locations. And it's only just over 17 miles from Tweedbank on to Hoyt. And we should be aiming to go there because Hoyt is the place that suffered worst from the loss of the railway, more so than Gala did. And, uh, you know, Hoyt's population has been declining, Gala's population has been growing. And I think if the railway had, had still been there, Hoyt would have been a very different place nowadays. The Forth Bridge is one of the most famous structures, not just in Scotland, but anywhere in the world. Billy Connolly once said that just looking at it made him feel proud, and he's not alone. England's got the Tower Bridge, France has the Eiffel Tower, but we've got the Forth Bridge, and it's been here since 1890. In well over a century, it's never had its own visitor centre dedicated to it, but things may be about to change. Recently, I spent some time at the bridge with Craig Bowman, Senior Communications Manager at Network Rail Scotland, and he told me about the exciting plans to give people the chance to get right to the heart of this amazing structure. Well, Craig, what a beautiful sight this is here at Forth Bridge, and of course it's the jewel and the crown, really, of Network Rail. Yeah, absolutely. It's Scotland's best landmark, probably the finest railway bridge in the world. Uh, still carries over 200 trains a day, and, you know, from our perspective, um, we couldn't have a a better uh, icon for Scotland Railways and Britain Railways. And the people back there knew how to build? They certainly did. It's 125 years old next year. It's just gone through uh, a 10 year refurb, which was mainly about the coating system and the paint job. Uh, but the, the steelwork itself was in great condition. It was only minor repairs required. Now you mentioned 125 year anniversary, 1890 it was built of course uh, all those years ago. Very soon though people as well as driving over it in the train will be able to actually go on it. Tell us about that, it's very exciting. Well certainly um, we've, we've got some proposals that we're taking forward at present. Uh, at the moment they are very much just proposals, we haven't taken them through planning process yet but certainly over the next uh, 6 to 12 months we, we aim to, to develop the proposals further so the that we have designs that we can take to, to the councils for, for planning. Um, we don't want to turn it into overly commercial. Um, we want it to be remain a, a, a place that people love. You know, the, the part of the experience is, you know, the village itself and both South and North Queens Ferry. So, you know, we, we need to be sensitive to that. Um, so, it's not it's not going to be Disneyland. It will be a, a very um, you know high class attraction and, and something uh, that we hope will be a, you know, popular for Scotland, but popular for Scottish people as well as for visitors to Scotland. People have been crossing this bridge by rail since 1890, but soon they'll be able to go on it themselves. As the only location where the main bridge structure can be accessed by land, North Queen's Ferry is the obvious choice for a fully accessible visitor centre. This proposal would see a discrete building created under the North Tower. An attractive shoreside walk would welcome visitors to a world-class facility that leaves no impact on the well-loved view of the bridge. With a glazed ceiling allowing visitors to experience the cathedral-like scale of this awe-inspiring structure, the centre would have ample room for eating, drinking and shopping, as well as one-off functions and events. From the main building, visitors will be guided up a step-free ramp through an educational and informative exhibition space to our lift access. Open to the elements, it will carry up to 15 people at a time on the three to four minute journey to our platform, 110 meters above sea level. The platform will provide the maximum wow factor with minimum impact on the profile of the bridge. Visitors will get the chance to enjoy views stretching from East Lothian to Ben Lomond. It would be open most days of the year and exposed to every kind of weather that the Scottish climate can offer, making every visit a unique experience. With regular passenger services and a short transfer time, we will work with train operators to ensure that visitors can make the most of this service to see the bridge in all its glory. On the South Queen's Ferry side, 
we imagine a more challenging visitor experience. In this concept, we propose a smaller hub to coordinate walks on the bridge. Entirely pre-booked, bridge walks would involve provision of safety gear and guided tours by specially trained leaders. In groups of up to 15 people, you will access the bridge up a slope, providing a taster for the later climb. From here, you will walk out along the approach span using a pre-existing walkway under the track. Once over the water, the real climb begins, with groups making their way to the top of the South Tower. Daring explorers can then take in the view before heading back to the comfort of the South Queen's Ferry hub. Now, as a person who works for Network Rail and, of course, uh, as a Scotsman himself, looking up at that structure, what does, it, what does it do to you? Well, I'll tell you what, it's better than sitting in an office, I can tell you that. It's great. I mean, this, this is the best part of my job coming out here uh, on a regular basis and, um, you know, very proud to, to have, you know, I live in the area um, or close by my my. Um, my father and my grandfather have worked in the area um, and you know just to think that they, they all saw this and, and felt the same pride as I do and now to have a chance to work in it well, uh, as I do um, you know it's can't think of a better job personally. Well I'm very excited to be uh, climbing up to the top tell us what's going to happen today. Uh, we'll be accessing the, the bridge by hoist which is just on the, the eastern face of the, the north tower uh, it takes about three or four minutes to, to reach the top uh, where we have a scaffolding platform um, it's a temporary platform, um, but it allows you to, to see great views from right over to East Lothian up to Ben Lomond. Uh, it gives you, gives you a real sense of the scale of the bridge, the incredible achievement of the, the engineers and the, the men who worked on it, uh, and for the, the vision that they had to, to create such a magnificent structure. So it's a pretty rare um, rare opportunity. We've only probably had about a thousand people up there over the, over the course of uh, the, the restoration period. So. Uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoy it and um, you know, our other visitors do as well. Well, I have to say, I've waited 53 years for this. Standing on the top of the fourth rail bridge, an absolutely extraordinary experience and a view that is second to none.